I'm Drew Christensen. I'm a distinguished professor of ethics, global human development, and a senior research fellow here at Berkeley Center. And uh, I'm chairing this, this panel on the uh, adventures of nonviolence in the Catholic tradition. With me today, uh, immediately at, at, my, uh, at my right, is, is David Hollenbach. He's the Pedro Arupe Distinguished Research Professor in the Wall School of Foreign Policy and a senior fellow here at the Berkeley Center. Um, before coming to Georgetown, he was a director of the Center for Human Rights and International Justice at Boston College. We have the University Chair in Human Rights and International Justice. His teaching research deal with human rights, theories of justice, religious and ethical responses to humanitarian crises, and religion and political life approached in a way shaped by the Catholic social, by Catholic social thought, contemporary theology, moral philosophy, and social science approaches. David and I go way back to uh, theology together, and our paths have crossed uh, here at Georgetown at the Woodstock Theological Center, and again uh, at Boston College a few years ago when I was a, on sabbatical there with, with him. So happy to have, we're happy to have David here now with us for the last couple of years and having to have him on the panel. Um, next is Marie Dennis. Uh, Marie is co-president of Pax Christi International, the global Catholic peace movement, a position she's held since 2007, and now chairs with Bishop Kevin Dowling from South Africa. She worked for Mary Nome uh, from 1989 to 20, uh, 2012, including 15 years as a director of the Mary Nome Office for Global Concerns. Um, I knew Marie when she was getting started with her, her friends uh, starting the, the eight-day center here in here in the Washington area, back in uh, back in the 70s, wasn't it? Yes, okay. Center for New Creation. Center for New Creation, okay. Um, uh, and uh, uh, she is the closest thing we have these days to a lady cardinal. <laughs> <laughs> She's taken uh, uh, Dolores Leckie's place. Dolores was at the Bishop's Concert many years, and she was so trusted and admired, we always called her the Lady Cardinal. So I think you're, you're trusted enough for so long that you have that, inherited that position. And alongside her is Gerald Schlabach. Uh, Gerald is a professor in the Department of Theology at the University of St. Thomas in St. Paul, Minnesota, and a past chair of the Department of Justice and Peace Studies there. That doesn't say all that Gerald is responsible for. He, he um, was really... Uh, an initiator of the, the Mennonite Catholic Dialogue in the U.S. with a group we call Bridge Folk. Uh, he initiated some very important discussions between advocates of the just war and nonviolence with an article about, about how uh, uh, just war can cease to be a church-dividing issue. Uh, and that went through a couple of different editions in which I was a respondent at different points. And then he, he, he did important work out of that on just policing as an alternative to just war. Um, and... Uh, He's been an important interlocutor on these issues for many years. I'm real happy to welcome him from Minnesota here in Washington. And without further ado, Gerald, I give you the give you the floor. Gerald's going to talk us about talk to us about where we came from. Well, thank you for the invitation to be here. Uh, I want to give begin by giving uh, special thanks to Drew, uh, not just for the invitation. Um, about if if my talk today were a paper, there would probably be a footnote to Drew on almost every page. Um, he could probably do this better than I can, but he you know he has to be on the other side of the uh, podium today, I guess. Um, now that, so that doesn't mean that he and I have agreed on everything. You know, academics, when they write acknowledgments, they end by saying, uh, I'm indebted to all these people, but of course, if, I've, if there are any mistakes, you know, it's my fault. So don't, don't blame him if there's uh, mistakes or things he wants to disagree on. Um, <clears throat> A year ago today, I learned this morning when I looked it up, uh, Pope Francis signaled uh, what would happen 10 months later, last August, uh, when he made a speech to various church leaders and uh, 
said more definitively than had been said before that capital punishment is uh, contrary to the gospel and is inadmissible. Uh, my th thesis signaling that there'd be a ch uh, revision of the catechism accordingly, which then got announced last August. Uh, my thesis this afternoon is not particularly original, uh, but it's that just war seems to be going the way of capital punishment, whether it will go all the way uh, to what's happened with capital punishment as of August, uh, I don't know. Uh, I think we're now with just war, more or less where capital punishment was uh, the last 20, 30 years, beginning with John Paul II. That capital punishment was possible in theory, that the church could imagine situations where communities had no other way of protecting themselves you know, from sociopath and so on. But given modern realities, given the way we can, you know, for better or for worse, can put people away for life and so on who are really sociopathic, uh, that um, what's possible in theory is no longer permissible in practice. Indicative of this same kind of status for just war. Um, yes, just war is still in the catechism. Principles of the criteria of just war are still cited. It continues to play an obvious role in diplomacy and advocacy since it has uh, contributed to the framework of international law. Occasionally, though less often, one hears uh, the Vatican more often U.S. bishops, uh, talk in general language about the right of national self-defense. Um, and yes, there's a reluctance to give up uh, the option of humanitarian military intervention for the particularly egregious cases of human rights abuse, genocide, and so on, which seem to call for humanitarian intervention according to principles of the responsi responsibility to protect, R2P. Um, so I'll return to that. Those are all, yes, of course, in, in those ways, just war is the just war theory, the just war tradition of moral discernment is still uh, on the books, still uh, appealed to in some situations. Uh, and yet, uh, and here I quote Jerry Powers from uh, the Kroc Institute at Notre Dame. I guess it's got a new name now, but uh, I haven't done this research myself, but uh, he has said that there hasn't been a Vatican declaration that any given war is just uh, since the middle of the 20th century. Uh, so yes, they're in theory, but in practice not uh, approved of. Here, I'd like to outline the basic trajectory that has gotten us here, uh, and then list some further signs, and then come back to this question of humanitarian intervention as the sort of best case for continuing the just war uh, tradition. Um, already prior to the Second Vatican Council, there were some lonely voices in some unexpected places uh, saying that war should be entirely forbidden. Uh, those of you that lived through the council or have studied it know that one of the, the there was a uh, group of about five cardinals who kind of dragged their feet at every point. Uh, one of them, the head of the, the Holy Office, um, Cardinal Ottaviani. Uh, so, reputation for an arch conservative. But he had been a pastor during World War II. He'd seen the damage. He'd seen the way that even um, uh, just war does grave injustices to the poor. And uh, so he'd written in some obscure places that war is always to be for forbidden. Um, 
And in fact, then at the Second Vatican Council, when he made a speech uh, giving support for the section on war and peacemaking in Gaudium et Spes, uh, reports are that he got the, the, the longest sustained applause in all four years came in response to his speech, probably because people were surprised. But uh, the Vatican II uh, documents, especially Gaudium et Spes, then made an invitation to the church to reappraise war in the modern world, um, especially in light of the lethality of modern weapons, uh, even conventional weapons, not just nuclear weapons. Uh, which seemed to kind of blow off the map the possibility of uh, discriminating, uh, making discriminating attacks that would avoid damage to civilians and so on. Uh, the council recognized conscientious objection in a way. It commended people who uh, are willing to renounce the right of self-defense, at least for themselves, at a personal level. Um, and it's significant that they then issued this invi an invitation to the church to, in light of all this, reappraise war in the modern world, make a fresh reappraisal of war. Uh, historically, popes and church councils don't open up debate. They tend to conclude it. Hopefully, you can debate whether this always happens, by uh, summarizing the consensus of the faithful. Well, here they did something different. They invited a discussion, which in a way we're still in. Uh, David, as I saw from his handout, is going to talk more about the, uh, the significance of the US bishop's uh, 1983 statement on the challenge of peace, recognizing two traditions in the church. Uh, in a way, a kind of an uneasy compromise, perhaps, but historically, um, historically based, just war, but then an also a tradition of uh, active nonviolence in resistance to injustice. And then came uh, the 1989 revolution, in which John Paul II played a major role and reflected on it two years later in Centesimus Anus, where as he looked back on what happened with the fall of the Soviet Union, the nonviolent uprising in, in, a, in Central Europe, is what he credited. Uh, you know, he played a role. Uh, presumably, he was humble enough that he wasn't going to be triumphalistic and said, I did this. But he also didn't credit as many of our politicians do, you know, Ronald Reagan's buildup of uh, arms against the Soviet Union, wearing them down, bringing, and so on. No, he credited, uh, how was it that the Cold War ended when, it look, we thought for years, he's writing that the only way to get out of it would be another world war. Uh, he said it had instead been overcome by the nonviolent commitment of people who, while always refusing to yield to the force of power, succeeded time after time in finding effective ways of bearing witness to the truth. Uh, and here I do want to give a footnote to Drew, because I don't know that I would have noticed this, thought about it otherwise. Uh, points out that in Centesimus Anus, Pope John Paul II, 1991, looking back on the revolution in 1989, is saying implicitly, active nonviolence has a role in public affairs at the highest level of geopolitics. And we've come a distance, this is Drew's point, we've come a distance from uh, Vatican II, which, yes, it's OK to be a conscientious objector. Um, that was enough of a breakthrough given things that Pius XII had said, that Christian pacifists, conscientious objectors were um, all but heretics. Um, so that was significant, but that was for pro that was a, a personal matter. They held up individual conscientious objectors to military participation and so on, 
uh, as an example of particular holiness. Uh, but by 1991, nonviolence is being credited uh, with the success of the world war fought by other means, uh, as I think uh, one political scientist has, has called it. So a, fur a few further signs along the way. Uh, John Paul II took a personal interest in Mennonite Catholic ecumenical dialogue. Uh, Drew played a role in this um, in, that was began, I think, in 1998 or 99, went for five years. Um, and uh, those of us that followed it closely um, think that, again, John Paul II actually may have known some, Mennonites. Mennonites is one of the historic peace churches, in some ways kind of the archetype of a, of a church committed to pacifism. It looks like John Paul II took a personal interest in that, or it wouldn't have happened, because it's the, it's the smallest group with which the Vatican has ever engaged in a, a formal ecumenical dialogue. Uh, since people have mentioned the Assisi World Day of Prayer uh, at various points, say a little more than I was going to about that, but uh, very briefly, again, for those of us following, again, Drew mentioned my interest in Mennonite Catholic uh, dialogue, of course, uh, those of us following it closely, there was a significant symbolic uh, move in the choreography of the event in 2002. In uh, 1986, it was significant enough that the president of Mennonite World Conference was invited at all. But he sat as far away from the pope as you could and be a Christian. <laughs> you know, these are the dissidents. They, you know, they not only broke with Rome, they broke with the mainline magisterium. So they're really not, you know, whatever. 1980, excuse me, 2002, the last religious leader at the event, the, the, lit, the litany where uh, both Christian and non-Christian uh, religious leaders make this commitment to renounce violence uh, in, for, uh, for religious purposes. This, you know, a litany of all of these, these pledges. The last one to make that statement before John Paul II closes, uh, you know, infirm as he is, but speaking as loud as he can at that point, you know, never again war, this kind of slogan. The last person before him was the new, now Indonesian, uh, president of Mennonite World Conference. Symbolic, but the Vatican, chore you know, does their choreography pretty, pretty tightly from everything I've heard. Anyway, so a few more uh, signs along the way. Uh, Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger, before becoming uh, Pope Benedict XVI, uh, at one point is in an interview is asked about, the, in 2003, is asked about the war in Iraq, whether it's just, uh, not only reiterates that the Pope has not said, has said it wasn't just, uh, there wasn't adequate reasons for it at least, goes on to say on his own, unprompted, uh, but you know, I'm paraphrasing, but the idea is given the lethality of modern war, uh, we need to take another look at whether any war is licit at all. Okay. Uh, and then in, um, uh, as Pope 2007 says some more in terms of love of enemy as a, is a realistic ma manifesto, the Magna Carta of Christian nonviolence, the nucleus of the Christian revolution. Maria is going to say more about, uh, if, I'm sure, about the event in Rome in uh, 2016. Uh, so I'll just jump over that. I think the state of the question is probably what um, many of us think was kind of a response to that meeting by uh, Francis in his 2017 World Day of Peace message. Uh, quoting, peace building through active nonviolence is the natural and necessary complement to the church's continuing efforts 
to limit the use of force by the application of moral norms. She does so by her participation in the work of international institutions and through the competent contribution made by many Christians in the drafting of legislation at all levels. Jesus himself offered a manual for this strategy of peacemaking in the Sermon on the Mount, and then goes on to hold up especially the Beatitudes. I'm suggesting that this, these sentences kind of give us the state of the question. Just war theory is not explicitly named. I think the pope is being, you know, savvy, diplomatic. The space that the just war tradition has traditionally taken up is named uh, as a set, uh, as a moral framework for being engaged in international diplomacy, legislation, and so on. Um, and it's complementary to active nonviolence. The challenge to moral theologians is, to, I think, to figure out that complementary complementarity. The challenge for just war Christians is to give the attention to the formation of active nonviolence that arguably the just war tradition itself requires. If you're going to keep war as last resort, you'd better be forming people to do a lot of other things first. Um, but then also a challenge to those of us who are advocates of nonviolence. I think suggesting you're going to have to help fill this space that just war tradition has traditionally taken up if you want to displace the just war. I was going to say more about, oh, um, back to the comparison with capital punishment, why it hasn't been eliminated entirely. Um, come back to this issue of humanitarian intervention, but maybe that'll come up in the conversation. So I've used my time. Thank you. Well, the, uh, the status questionis continues to develop. Uh, and three years ago, uh, Fox Christie held a meeting in, in Rome uh, under the sponsorship of the Dicastery for Integral Human Development, uh, looking at just peace. And uh, that began to move the goalposts again. And uh, to discuss how that took place, we have the co-president of Pax Christi International, Marie Dennis, who's going to talk about the Catholic Nonviolence Initiative. Thank you, Drew. It's very nice to be here. It was a very interesting day so far. <clears throat> I just want to start with a couple of um, definitions, if you will, at least to explain how we're using uh, the terms. Um, Violence, uh, what, in the conversation that we've been having <clears throat> as Pax Christi and the Catholic Nonviolence Initiative, which is, although it's a project of Pax Christi, it involves uh, many religious congregations and other uh, Catholic organizations, number of universities, and so on. <clears throat> We're trying to talk about violence not only as direct violence, not only as the violence of war, but um, as structural, systemic violence, cultural violence, uh, as a, a violence described broadly, because that's the reality of the world that we're living in. It's, we are not always uh, in a, the context of uh, facing the possibility of war, and yet we are in contexts of a constant array of um, violence that is often um, not so visible, often irregular, <clears throat> in much the same way when we talk about nonviolence, as in the Catholic Nonviolence Initiative, we're somewhat deliberately using the expression nonviolence, although we've had thousands of hours of conversation about nonviolence as a negative term, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Mostly, we, we continue to use it because we believe that the concept of nonviolence does set clear boundaries around the kind of activities and actions and um, <clears throat> directions in which we will move as we try to build a just peace. It certainly includes the movement toward just peace. It is not negative. It's not passive. It's not the same as pacifism. Um, but it is, uh, we believe, a very broad set of uh, potential strategies and tools from diplomacy to trauma-informed uh, healing to restorative justice 
to nonviolent resistance. It is not only um, uh, chaining yourself to the fence or crossing a line, although that sometimes is the strategy used, but it's a much broader um, uh, uh, reality than that. Part of what the Catholic Nonviolence Initiative has been doing is to try to stir the creative imagination of people around the world working in very different contexts to both be observant of the nonviolent strategies that they are already using in order to transform conflict before it becomes violent, and to then look at ways to share that experience with each other to give us all more tools that are practically applicable in different contexts of, uh, of growing of conflict that is becoming violent. For Pax Christi members around the world, nonviolence is a spirituality, a way of life, a deep commitment to live the values that we believe shaped the early Christian community in the first century context of occupied Palestine where violence was a way of life. For us, the so-called hard sayings of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount are central. But the challenge is how to interpret that message in the context of a 21st century world immersed in extremely complex situations of violence, in contexts of fear, as we were talking about this morning, a fear that is too often orchestrated. We are told, be afraid, be very afraid. How can we break into that reality? Um, what is security? How do we um, uh, create another way of, of resolving, of transforming conflict, when part of the challenge is to overcome a reality in which violence and conflict and war are very big business, not only in our country, but around the world. The challenge is huge. And so from our perspective, um, the, to stimulate the creative imagination of people around the world who are dealing already in nonviolent ways, in very violent situations, is a worthy endeavor. For the past 1,400 years, Catholic teaching on war and peace, as articulated in the just war tradition, has had a significant impact on the public, on political decision makers, and on international humanitarian law. The intention, as has been said many times, was to limit or deter war, but too often that's not what happened. In the last century, as Gerald said clearly, Catholic teaching on war and peace has begun to shift, giving much more attention to the potential of, and the effectiveness of nonviolent alternatives as civil resistance campaigns around the world in the end of the uh, 1980s were amazingly successful. But at the same time, very few of the, what, 1.2, 1.3 billion Catholics in the world learned anything about nonviolence as a, power, as a positive and powerful force for social change, as a process for ending violence without resort to lethal force, for transforming conflict, and for protecting vulnerable people, or about the broader understanding of nonviolence as essential to our Catholic Christian faith tradition. In recent years, as uh, I'm sure you know well, groundbreaking empirical research has demonstrated the effectiveness of active nonviolence and the importance of increased investment in understanding, developing, teaching, and scaling up nonviolent approaches to addressing major national or international crises. <clears throat> a good part or the, uh, some of the empirical research that has been, uh, has gotten a great deal of international attention uh, was written up in uh, Maria Stefan and Erica Chenoweth's book, Why Civil Resistance Works. But their case is focused on civil resistance as one expression of a nonviolent strategy that has been shown to be effective. Um, much other research is being done on other expressions of nonviolent, of active nonviolence, in order to ascertain where and in what circumstances this or another strategy might be effectively used. 
In April of 2016, as Drew said, the Pontifical Council for Justice and Peace, now the new dicastery for promoting integral human development, and Pax Christi International invited 85 people from around the world to Rome for what has been called a landmark conference on nonviolence and just peace. Participants came together to try to imagine a new framework for Catholic teaching on war and peace that could help the world move beyond repeated cycles of violence and war. Central to our conversation were voices of people promoting active nonviolence themselves in the midst of horrific violence. Many conference participants came from countries that have been at war or dealing with extreme violence for decades. Iraq, Sri Lanka, Colombia, South Sudan, the DR Congo, Mexico, Afghanistan, Palestine, El Salvador, Croatia, the Philippines, Northern Ireland, Lebanon, Burundi, Guatemala, Uganda, South Africa, and more. Their testimony about the power of nonviolence and the urgent need to end war was extremely powerful. Iraqi Dominican sister Nazak Mati, whose community was expelled from Mosul by ISIS not too long before our conference in Rome, said, war is the mother of ignorance, isolation, and poverty. Please tell the world there is no such thing as a just war. I say that, she said, as a daughter of war. We can't respond to violence <clears throat> with worse violence. Jesuit Francisco de Roo, from Colombia, and we heard much about Colombia this morning, <clears throat> talked about the use of the just war tradition by all sides in the war in Colombia to justify their entry into the violence. We believe we can do better than that. During the conference, we wrote an appeal to the Catholic Church. I have some water right there. Yeah, yeah. I've got some here. What's that? Thank you. <clears throat> Gathered in Rome, we heard many similar stories from conference participants, courageous people in local communities living with what was unimaginable danger, people who had tried nonviolent strategies and found them to be both powerful and effective. During the conference, we wrote an appeal to the Catholic Church to recommit to the centrality of gospel nonviolence, urging the church to, quote, integrate gospel nonviolence explicitly into the life, including the sacramental life and work of the church through dioceses, parishes, agencies, schools, universities, seminaries, religious orders, voluntary associations, and others, and to consider adopting the concept of, of just integral peace as one example of a new nonviolent framework for Catholic teaching. We asked Pope Francis specifically to write a World Day of Peace message and someday an encyclical on nonviolence. Obviously, we were really delighted when Pope Francis wrote the uh, 2017 World Day of Peace message on nonviolence, a style of politics for peace. In asking the church to adopt a new moral framework based on nonviolent practice for its teaching on violence and war, we're in fact building on a tradition that is already moving in that direction. Given what we now know about the consequences of horrific violence and war, the cost in human life, psychological trauma, moral injury, environmental damage, climate disruption, and on and on and on, and given the vast resources spent on preparations for war, resource, resources that, are, as has been said so many times, are desperately needed for integral human development, the church has repeatedly insisted that a just war is practically impossible and has called for an end to war as a human institution in many instances. Clearly, ethical norms to guide political decision makers in a violent world are necessary. Many such norms are well ensconced in international humanitarian law and would also be included in a new moral framework with a focus on nonviolent approaches. In fact, any use of force, including, for example, sanctions or nonviolent civil resistance, should be subject to a rigorous ethical evaluation. 
At the November 2017 Vatican Conference on Nuclear Disarmament, Bishop McElroy from uh, San Diego said, quote, the church is in the midst of a fundamental reappraisal of how to balance the Christian obligation to nonviolence with the need to resist evil in the world. The traditional norms of just war, particularly in the jus ad bellum, increasingly appear incapable of effectively constraining violence in the modern world, he said. The power of nonviolence, once relegated to the category of romantic idealism, has emerged as a potent force for social transformation and the building of lasting peace. Bishop McElroy continued, the church must be a voice in the world constantly pointing humanity toward the path of nonviolence and the logic of peace. This radically positive approach, he said, demands that we change the default position in our reasoning about war from acquiescence in the patterns and structures of violence to an active and persistent engagement with strategies of peace. The Catholic Nonviolence Initiative that grew out of the 2016 Rome Conference on Nonviolence and Just Peace <clears throat> as a project of Pax Christi International, believes that the church, the Catholic church, can play a major positive role in making this happen. The Catholic church with its diplomatic presence in almost every country and at all major multilateral organizations has a well-developed network of universities, seminaries, religious communities, parishes, publications and media outlets, a membership of over a billion people, and rich spiritual and theological resources that could make a tremendous contribution to the development and acceptance of nonviolent approaches to a more peaceful world. What if Catholics were formed from the beginning of life to understand and appreciate the power of active nonviolence and the connection of nonviolence to the heart of the gospel? What if the Catholic community understood as vocation the call to be builders of peace, promoters of a nonviolent approach to our personal and our political relationships with each other and with the rest of creation? What if the Catholic Church committed its vast spiritual, intellectual, and financial resources to developing a new moral framework and language for discerning ways to prevent atrocities, to protect people, and to protect the planet in a dangerous world? In the past two years, Pax Christi and the Catholic Nonviolence Initiative has engaged in a very serious conversation with the Vatican and with the local church around the world, including in many war zones, about the breadth and potential of active nonviolence to further sustaining peace. An ambitious, carefully organized international process of discussion and discernment involving a number of the people here, theologians, peace practitioners, activists, and academics, with significant differences of opinion among them, has recently concluded. We have been exploring a systematic theology of nonviolence and a careful scriptural exegesis of nonviolence. We've been trying to articulate a new moral framework that would include some or all of the norms developed as part of the just war tradition, but are hoping that we perhaps can leave the language of just war behind. We've been reflecting on women and nonviolence, on ecology and nonviolence, on nonviolence in other faith traditions. We've been gathering excellent examples of nonviolent action in different circumstances around the world and are developing specific proposals for how the institutional church could uh, integrate nonviolence into its very fabric. We hope that this process will make a contribution to Catholic teaching, possibly an encyclical on active non nonviolence and just integral peace. Next year in 2019, we will organize a second conference on nonviolence and just peace to share with the Vatican the outcome of this extensive process. Many additional events and encounters are energizing the conversation about active nonviolence and just peace in different contexts. Religious congregations and universities in particular involved. There's a long list of uni Catholic universities that have already held either conferences or seminars or, uh, or conversations that picked up on a particular piece of this large topic in which that university was particularly well versed. 
We're working to identify and support more and clearer public policy proposals at the United Nations, with the European Union, in Washington and elsewhere, that promote peace building and nonviolent approaches to national and international conflicts so that the world will actually have alternatives well articulated to military action when crises occur in the future. We're also listening very carefully to people from different contexts, believing that nonviolence in the context of occupation in Palestine, nonviolence in the context of poverty or street violence in Haiti, Nonviolence from the perspective of liberation theologians in Latin America, nonviolence in Europe facing an uncertain future, nonviolence intersecting with structural racism in the United States, nonviolence in post colonial Africa, nonviolence in Asia and the Pacific where the nuclear threat is all too real, may look very different one from the other. And finally, Pax Christi International has initiated a pretty simple global campaign, hashtag this is nonviolence, using social media and a variety of other formats to just help people imagine and invest in developing more robust nonviolent tools. In many ways, Pope Francis has already begun to do what we are asking the Catholic Church to do. And we know that's true in many universities as well. But he, by talking often about the power of nonviolence and by stirring the imaginations of people, including political decision makers, who should be desperate to prevent war and protect vulnerable people without resort to arms. Just one last thought. In the last few months, as once again the crisis of uh, the sexual abuse has come to the fore, in the Catholic Church and in the media around the world. We have come to believe even more deeply that the Catholic Church could make a significant contribution in response to that crisis, if at, both in church and society, by nurturing nonviolent relationships within the church, by transforming what are actually violent power over relationships uh, within the church and beyond, and by transforming the structures of the church uh, in the direction of nonviolence. So, thank you. Thank you, Mary. Sometimes you get glimpses of how things are changing, and um, uh, the Mennonite, Catholic Mennonite dialogue and the international one was something of a revelation to me that way, but particularly after we had written an, uh, our our report, which is called uh, uh, be, uh, uh, called Be Peacemakers Together, uh, we met two years later to prepare another statement, a common statement for the World Council of Churches dialogue uh, for, uh, to end their, their decade against, against violence. Um, and um, uh, as we wrote it, uh, Helmut Harder, who was the, uh, uh, the, the head of the Mennonite section, uh, suggested that we include the Sermon on the Mount as the, as the charter of the Christian faith. And uh, uh, I was serving, it as it turned out, as the theologian for both sides. It uh, mm -hmm. doesn't often happen, but <laughs> by that time I knew as much Mennonite theology as I did Catholic, I think. But uh, uh, I, I remember Gerald, kind of his work to end uh, just war as a church dividing issue. And Gerald would have been very happy that day because I said, I pointed out now, I, Catholics have to realize that what we're saying here is that non-retaliation is the foundation of the Christian faith. There were representatives from four Vatican offices there, and they all agreed, and they were from several countries. So the, the, the sense about nonviolence had penetrated the church not only across continents, but even into the Vatican bureaucracy, which much, was much to my surprise. Now, um, uh, as, um, as Gerald and, and uh, Marie have said, the just war is contained in it intentions to prevent uh, uh, and, and to limit violence in wartime and to talk about the specific uh, direction and uses of just war. David Hollenbach is here to instruct us.
So I have a PowerPoint, which I hope I can get to work here. Um, it's great to be with you, and I'm very grateful for the presentations of Jared and Marie both. And I agree with 98% of what they have said, but not 100%. So we will find some interesting dis points of discussion, I think. I'm going to talk about nonviolence, justice, and reconciliation. And the point at which I will probably diverge from them is in the stress on justice that I am going to try to bring to the fore uh, in, our, in our conversation. One point I think that's really crucial is, and I think both uh, Jared and, and Marie have mentioned this, is that the Catholic tradition here is both complex and developing. Uh, I always like a, a phrase used once by Yaroslav Pelikan, who was a very distinguished historian of doctrine at uh, Yale University, who once said that a living tradition is the living thoughts of the dead, whereas traditionalism is the dead thoughts of the living. <laughs> and uh, so what we need, I think, are living thoughts drawn from the past about this as they apply to our contemporary situation, and that's where the developing situation comes to the fore. Now, we've seen, as both of our previous two speakers have emphasized, a really important, and this is the point at which I will agree very strongly with both of our previous speakers about the importance of nonviolence, the commitment to taking action for the preservation of people, uh, their dignity, their worth as persons in nonviolent ways, and that Pope Francis stressed this in his 2017 World Day of Peace message, namely that, that nonviolence may, should become the hallmark of our decisions, our relationships, and our actions, and indeed of political life in all forms. So there's a strong emphasis on the need for approaches to nonviolence. Uh, there are biblical bases for this coming from the Sermon on the Mount, which I just highlight there, a couple of phrases there. Blessed are the peacemakers, offer no resistance. By the way, that offer no resistance does not mean offer no resistance to evil. It means don't resist it violently. Uh, it certainly calls for strong resistance to evil, but the Greek is me antistenai, uh, which doesn't mean sort of lie down and let it happen uh, and love your enemies and so forth. Now, Given that, there is also, though, a strong emphasis in the Catholic tradition continuing today, as Jared has highlighted, the, about the possibility of some legitimate resort to the use of armed force uh, for legitimate defense if every peaceful means to settlement has been exhausted. And this is where we get notions like last resort and so forth. This is the Second Vatican Council, Gaudium et Spes, that should say, not Gaudium at 55, but it's, uh, <laughs> it's a mistake in the typing there. Uh, now, the way in which I conceive of this is by the, uh, this diagram. I like to think of the goal that we're, we're seeking from a Christian point of view as the goal of shalom. The Hebrew word can be translated as peace, can be translated as wholeness, can be translated as reconciliation, but it means a society marked by shalom is a society in which all persons are living together with each other in mutual respect and in genuine mutual support for each other. And therefore, this notion of shalom clearly includes the avoidance of war, the avoidance of conflict, but the key point from my point of view is that it also includes justice that respect for the dignity of each person as a demand of justice. And this, I think, was what Marie was highlighting when she was saying, we're not just dealing here with the avoidance of war. We're also dealing with a variety of ways in which human beings could be oppressed, deny their dignity, put down in various ways. And that's the point that is highlighted in my way of thinking by noting that shalom includes the notion uh, of justice and not only nonviolence, especially if nonviolence is interpreted as simply avoiding war, which is not what we want to do, but if just is highlighting the fact that justice is a key part of shalom. Uh, now, the question that emerges if we go back to this dialogue is what do we do 
about the issue about nonviolence and justice if there is tension between them. And there are several possible paths. A.J. Musty, a famous Men uh, Mennonite thinker who also had some Quaker roots, uh, a famous statement of his, there is no way to peace. Peace is the way. Uh, and therefore, I find that a very important kind of commitment towards saying if you're going to pursue the fullness of shalom, it has to be done through peaceful and nonviolent means. But Paul VI, at his, fam his famous speech at the United Nations, also said, if you want peace, work for justice. These two statements do not have to conflict with each other. They can, in fact, be fully harmonious with each other. But where I suspect I diverge a bit from Marie and Jared is in saying there are some circumstances in which they may conflict with each other in extreme cases. And that's where the question of what happens when they do and if they do. Uh, now, the US bishops back in, 19, in 2001 in a document that commemorated the 1983 pastoral letter that they issued uh, on the challenge of peace. But in 2001, they it's issued actually a- actually 1993. This is when it was reprinted. Oh, OK. It's 93. I've got the wrong date there. I knew it was a 10-year anniversary. <laughs> but the harvest of justice is sown in peace. Talk to be says that our constant commitment ought to be as far as possible to strive for justice through nonviolent means. But then they make this statement, when sustained attempts at nonviolent action fail to protect the innocent, legitimate political authorities are permitted as a last resort to employ limited force to rescue the innocent and establish justice. That's where we move over toward the possible legitimation of the just use of armed force. Now, that's clearly last resort, limited force, uh, as far as possible through nonviolent means, a whole host of things like that. Now, this points to the fact that in the bishop's past, in the bishop's document of 93, that there's a strong presupposition against the use of violent force. Uh, and if any use of force is ever justified, it is by way of exception to the use to nonviolence. And that means that what we're talking about here is at least many, I would want to argue that if there is any just war theory, it should be called the unjust and just war theory, because it probably means that most of the violent force that has taken place in our world is unjust, because the, any, any violent departure from nonviolence is by way of exception and by way of last resort. Now, that's highlighted if you go back to Thomas Aquinas. I'm one of these moral theologians who likes to go back and read some of these classic documents. But in Aquinas, in his uh, Questions on War, in the Treatise on War, it's very interesting if you go back and look at everything in Aquinas in the Summa Theologiae is formulated in terms of a question. He asks a question. And then he gives a series of opinions from various people about them. And then he gives his own position on it. And the question that he, deal, that he deals with in dealing with war is, is it always sinful to fight in war? In Latin, utrum bellare semper sit peccatum. Is it always a sin to fight in war? What I would highlight there is, that means the presupposition of Aquinas's just war theory is that it is, it is sinful to fight in war. He's just asking whether it's always sinful. And his answer is, not always. And that gives you a series of criteria uh, of cri where, where the limitations of the use of force might be justifiable. Um, now, I would highlight, we could go into long discussion about the jus ad bellum and jus in bello criteria and what they mean, but I would like to highlight the fact that today, in fact, where I think the real development about exceptions to the use of nonviolence 
as the key per way of pursuing justice may come to the fore is in these cases of the responsibility to protect people against grave atrocities. I bring this to the fore because I've had some experience of visiting Rwanda. I was in Rwanda not long after the genocide, and I'll never forget seeing piles of dead bodies still unburied, and knowing that the United States, France, and the United Kingdom took action to prevent General Romeo Dallaire, who was the Canadian commander of the peacemaking force in Rwanda at that time, to prevent him from taking action to, prevent, to, to stop the genocide. In my judgment, that was the wrong thing to do. I think in the Rwanda genocide, Romeo Dallaire, the general from Canada who's still very much active in these issues, Romeo Dallaire has said that if he had had 5,000 more troops, he could have saved 300,000 lives. That's where I think a question of justice comes to the fore. Not because I think we want to encourage violence and war and so forth. It's just that I think that in a circumstance like that, we may be facing an extraordinary exception to the commitment to nonviolence. And that's where I don't want to see us abandon the possibility of taking action to prevent that kind of thing from happening. I also had the experience this summer of being in Sarajevo in Bosnia, and he, talking to the people who lived through what happened in Bosnia during the, the breakup of, the, of, of, of Yugoslavia. And what happened at Srebrenica in Bosnia was another case where the United Nations said they were providing a safe haven for people to come and be safe, to be prevent, protected against uh, Serbian attacks that were coming from the hills and from Serbian attacks coming from the ground. The UN failed to take sufficient action to protect them, and almost all the men in Srebrenica were killed, the women were raped, and the children were taken away and ethnically cleansed. That was, in my judgment, a serious violation of justice that the United Nations military forces in Srebrenica should have been ordered to take action to prevent. Now, I'm not trying to say, therefore, let's have lots of wars. I'm trying to say, let's not abandon the possibility of, in extreme circumstances, of taking that kind of action. That, let me conclude then by saying that we want to move ultimately, though, toward reconciliation and peace building. Uh, that's the direction in which I think we need to move. One of the things that's crucial about the document produced about the responsibility to protect um, is that it calls for prevention of conflict uh, very, very severely. This is from the US bishops, though, that that justice demands establishing at least basic conditions of participation for people in the human community, and the ultimate injustice is for a person to be treated actively or abandoned passively as if they were non-human, non-members of the human race, and we have to prevent those kinds of injustices, and that's going to call for uh, preventing the kind of social division of society by war. That uh, one way of seeing that, that lightning bolt there is a way of dest destroying justice in society as well as bringing conflict. It breaks the social unity of peace. It breaks the social unity of a just society, dividing it by war and by oppression. And that's what we need to avoid. We want to avoid that by establishing what might be called restorative justice after conflict, 
Well, this morning it was raised a question about whether you don't want to go back to where, where things were and restore. I would also want to sometimes call this creative justice. How do we create a society where there's social unity and peaceful coexistence? And that's a, a form of justice that I think is absolutely crucial. So justice combined with forgiveness is the way to peace. Forgiveness can break the cycle that leads to more violence. It avoids the reversal of roles of oppressor and oppressed. And that means that we have a, a responsibility, it seems to me, to take the kind of action that heals society and puts society back together. That's where I would argue that reconciliation, uh, both through, there, there are a couple of criteria that could be used here, which I could have included in my slideshow but forgot to. We can talk about Yusad Bellum and Yusin Bello as the classic criteria for just war. But I would like also to include several new criteria that some others have highlighted. Yus ante et contra bellum, justice before and against war. So this would be a way of bringing justice into the prevention and overcoming of war, not simply justice of using criteria for when war might be justified. But that's part of the ideal of prevention, and that would bring justice and nonviolence into more harmony with each other. But I would still stand for saying that there may be some exceptions uh, in the extreme case where I don't want to say that nonviolence is always the only solution to situations in grave danger to human beings. Thank okay. you. Thank you, David. Um, I think all of you can be very concrete about the steps that can be taken, whether it's in ante contra, contra bellum or whether it's in making a parish uh, 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 aware and active in nonviolence. Uh, but let me just go back and say at the time the bishops wrote the 1993 pastoral statement, How Versus Justice is Sown in Peace, there was an efflorescence of new developments and in institutions to try to prevent war. Uh, uh, there was kind of affirmative diplomacy. There was uh, contacts between military officials. There were regular uh, threat reduction kind of activities. Uh, a lot of them, as we discovered, as relations with the Soviet or the R Russia have been breaking down, uh, no longer exist or are, are, are not used. What kind of what kind of uh, institutions do we need to make uh, justice uh, make peace? Uh, and nonviolence effective. Well, I'd like Well, I think we need, and here's where the church, churches generally, Catholic Church is, um, you know, one of the largest trans-border institutions in the world, um, can Speak take a, can take a role. Uh, <clears throat> um, I think the example of R Rwanda, the issue of humanitarian military intervention. Um, to me, actually illustrates the problem, David, that um, to marshal military uh, forces, you need political support in places where, and to, to do that, you need national self-interest. And, you know, the fact that the U.S., uh, European nations, um, not only intervened against an intervention, uh, but, you know, illustrates the fact that, that you're going to have a lot of problems in any, even, even be, before the sort of resurgence of nationalism that we have right now, you know, the, the, 
the conservative national security realist argument is, um, you know, you're not going to intervene where there isn't national self-interest. In some places in the world where this is most needed, there isn't an obvious national self-interest. And then on the other side, from more progressive lefty folks, even if you would, then you then you have a recipe for uh, going around and intervening in you know, any any place that there's serious human rights um, violations. It's a recipe for building an empire. So I, I'm not sure we have. If that's the if that's the limit case in which uh, you know you can make the strongest argument as you've done for continuing uh, to imagine just wars. Um, well, the just war tradition also claims that it is more politically realistic than nonviolence. Well, is it really realistic to expect nations to marshal support to intervene in places that they don't have any self-interest? So I think it, we're, we're only at the beginning of scaling up active nonviolence. There are pilot projects uh, in terms of intervening in, in hot wars, in serious places, uh, in places of serious conflict. Um, there are some NGOs that are trying to do that, offering pilot projects. We've got a long ways to go. But I think that's as realistic as expecting nation states to protect people that their own constituencies don't really care about. So. Globalization, for all its problems, is creating new networks, new technologies that allow people to band together in coalitions of the non nonviolent coalitions of the willing in order to find ways to do the whole range from sending in mediators to actively placing bodies in the way of conflict and so on. I, just to add to that, I, I, what I'm really interested in is um, perhaps not trying to get to that last most extreme case when maybe there isn't anything else that can be done. But um, because I'm not, I don't know that we'll ever reach agreement on that. I think that there, there is a, a, just a, a a very deep difference in terms of whether uh, there is a last resort for the use of, of, uh, of armed force. But it, what does seem to me important is that we recognize that, um, it, that we can't forever claim that there isn't another uh, option, another nonviolent option, if we haven't uh, seriously invested in that. So um, as you were saying, Drew, I think, unfortunately, there's been a tendency for the world to move away from an effort to invest in diplomacy, or I should say our own country, um, to invest in diplomacy, to invest in what we know makes for peace. I was very interested in some of the recent work um, that has come out of the, uh, the review of the UN peacekeeping oper peace operations um, that, that uh, lifted up uh, both a long list of um, those uh, um, societal commitments, and a lot of them have to do with justice, that we know ultimately contribute to a more peaceful society, to a more peaceful world. And that, um, to, so to talk about sustaining peace as the, as the work of every country around the world all the time, uh, because it's about, um, it's about strengthening our capacity to build peace, I think that the very specific uh, programs, institutions, um, strategies that are nonviolent that can be effective are, um, uh, I think they're contextually specific. And that although there are some, there is a need to invest, I think, in institutions that help foster that, the development of those sorts of programs, I think in reality, What's perhaps more important is that um, is that uh, we, from the local level all the way to the multilateral international level, 
we are looking all the time at all of the possibilities. We're investing financial resources, uh, person power, research time, um, training, educational capacity in asking what nonviolent responses in this situation will work. Um, so sometimes I think it actually is. We know that, um, somebody was saying this morning, that um, a, a, a traumatized uh, community, a traumatized person um, uh, is, is not able to be, to, to pursue the kind of um, just peace uh, when, when the woundedness is never attended to. And so some of the work that we need to do has to do with uh, how we, what we teach our children. It has to do with how we um, heal in the wake of terrible violence and war. It, but it also has to do with how much we invest in diplomacy. What's the first thing we do in a situation of crisis? So I think that what, what we're saying is not so much that there is not ever going to be an occasion when, when intervention that is uh, armed intervention is necessary, but that if we don't learn to to um, uh, both uh, function in a way ourselves and promote uh, sort of the the development of nonviolent tools, we will always repeatedly be in situations where we where we don't have an alternative. So I, I think that I think we're not so far apart in what we're saying. It's just, um, and I don't think there's a magic answer. I don't believe that, um, yes, the responsibility to protect is an extremely important principle, but how do we protect? What does that look like? That's the question that I think we need to be asking. David, can you, can you talk about some of those means of uh, uh, exercising uh, justice contrabellum and Yes, yeah, I mean, I mean, we're talking about a whole series of initiatives globally about creating a rule-based world order, a set of, of criteria that govern our economic life internationally, about ways in which we look at the uh, at the expectations about about the way we mutually commit ourselves to supporting one another in international affairs, uh, the way in which we deal with trade, the way there's a whole range of issues. And Jared mentions about the, the, the rise of contemporary nationalism. <laughs> well, that's very, very much opposed to the direction in which these institutions that I think are really needed are, should be going. I mean, after World War II, uh, a lot of people realized they needed the European Union in order to achieve peace. And now they want to take it apart. And the UK is pulling out of it. There's a bunch of people in Germany called Alternative for Deutschland who wants to get, rem and so I think that's a huge mistake. And that's the sort of thing that I would want to argue about justice, that this is a way in which these are big mistakes. And there are forms of nonviolence, for sure, but there are forms of diplomacy and forms of, of international institution building. And there we have to sustain those things. And um, I was just uh, lecturing for a little bit earlier. I had to teach this afternoon, and I was, I mean, I've been just working on the refugee issue very extensively. And the attitude that the United States is developing toward refugees around the world, especially toward Muslims, is a good way to stimulate anger from the Muslim world that's going to cause further terrorism. And what's happening in France with the banning of the veil uh, on the part of Islamic women and on a number of other things that are treating Muslims as people that are not welcome in France. That's the sort of thing that generates conflict. And that's the kind of injustice that I think is really uh, very much opposed to the direction in which I would want to go. So I don't want to be interpreted as somehow being here in favor of let's figure out how we can use force against people. Because that's not what I, I, I'm saying. It's absolutely nonviolent means are the preferred way of approaching through these institutions. All I'm saying is I don't agree with the statement that was made at your conference that there is no such thing as a just war. 
and I want to say that's not true. And, and that, that's all I'm, all I'm saying. So I'm not, I'm, I'm not a warmonger. I'm just somebody who wants to, I, I know. But every time I say this sort of thing, people say, oh, you're not against war enough. I don't think that's true. Harold, you, anyway. you, you had, a, had a famous uh, maxim about uh, making nonviolence uh, churchwide and parish deep. Uh, I again want to get to metrics. I want to get to the, 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 the various kinds of techniques and practices that are, that are used in, in this kind of nonviolent peacemaking. Different. What would make a parish? Uh, what would make a parish nonviolent? What kind of steps? What kind of exercise? What kind of practices do you need there? Um, well, just I want to respond. I'm going to no, circle no, you back. Did that, you did no, that once. I I'm going to no, I'm, but but it's related to this. I'm going to circle. Uh, just in in general response, you know, if the two percent difference that you describe us as having really were stayed two percent, uh, you know, I don't think there would be a difference. In in other words, even as I, and I say that partly because as I start to imagine what happen in what could happen in my parish, uh, I would actually want to include teaching the just war criteria, which we're not even doing in our parishes, and, and, tr and challenging young people that if you want, you know, that this, the kind of a sense of adventure and seeing the world and contribute to the common good that leads people to sign up to the military. Here's a whole bunch of other ways to at least look at next to military service. Um, so that if the presumption against, uh, against violence, against war, really is operative in our parishes, we're going to give our young people a whole lot of challenges of uh, ways to serve the common good. Uh, and then those that really feel a vocation to uh, enter the military um, as an act of service, then it's then we'll we'll make it we'll set up uh, processes for discernment, accountability about that, so that it's really vocation. But we'll 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 be challenging our young people to other ways of service, you know, Jesuit voluntary service, for example. Um, you know, my, my model would, in a way, I'm, I'm, the one way that I'm jealous of the Mormons is their, you know, two or three year uh, expectation for their young people to do some kind of mission work. Uh, you know, why can't we have, why can't we mobilize our young people with that kind of um, sense of vocation. If we do that, then we start to lay out, yeah, I mean, I'm realistic uh, that the just war tradition isn't going to go away uh, probably in my, well, I don't want to speculate. Um, so I'm asking people, you know, who would identify with what David is saying, at least take the just war tradition really serious as a limitation, but lay that up against a whole other w set of, and start to create institutions for service and community engagement that then, then and along with that comes uh, training in active nonviolence as part of a general lifestyle of, of Christian service in the community, on and on, so. I would agree. I guess I would add a few other uh, pieces in talking about a parish. One would be uh, a serious scriptural reflection on uh, what wh what what can we learn from the scriptures about violence and nonviolence and the, the the how what was what was the way that Jesus engaged in the um, struggle for justice. Uh, for example, against the occupiers in his in his experience. Um, so I think the preaching and the uh, the scriptural reflection should be uh, digging deeply into these questions. Um, 
I think just learning nonviolent communication in, uh, in, at a parish level is a, at a very important skill to have. I think our children it, at, a, at an elementary level should be uh, understanding uh, nonviolent communication, should be understanding how to deal with conflict, which is, as was said earlier, a part of life. How do you, how do you uh, engage with conflict uh, without um, uh, uh, perpetuating or initiating violence. Um, I think that that in, I would agree with what what Gerald said. And then I think just learning about um, those experiments in um, in nonviolent engagement uh, in the public arena, that some of which are, uh, for example, in the city of Chicago. Uh, Cardinal Supic has a major commitment to nonviolence and to dealing with the violence in the city of Chicago in a way that gets at the root causes of that of that of the violence and deals with it in a way that doesn't exacerbate violence. Um, to understand that uh, efforts like Christian peacemaker teams and nonviolent peace force and others are engaging in creative ways in many different conflicts in the world, but they're doing it without any real financial support from anywhere. It's all um, uh, NGOs and on a you know shoestring. So then that we begin to look at how what what are the priorities in in our national budgets or our local budgets? Um, how do our police forces work? Can we imagine uh, uh, that we might learn something from the um, police force in uh, England, in the UK, that actually is not always armed with a firearm, but um, armed with a bat, and only special forces with a firearm. So uh, it seems to me that engagement in local community, a look at wh who we are as, uh, as people of faith following a, a tradition in which Jesus had a lot to say about violence and nonviolence, and a lot, and and his way of living um, speaks very loudly to us in these times. Could go on and on. Okay. David, uh, let me. I'm going to show you. This seems may seem that left field, but it has to do with R2P, which you both spend a lot of time thinking about. How would you? I mean, the, the international law calls the just law precautionary principles. And part of deciding whether to intervene uh, with force in involves having to use the precautionary principles. Uh, how would you have applied the just war principles to intervening in Syria? I would say don't intervene. OK, well, explain. Well, I mean, there are a whole series of reasons why, if you're, I mean, if you're talking about intervening by military force, yeah, I mean, you've got to find a way that there's a reasonable hope of success. That's a standard just war criterion. Sending military forces into Syria doesn't seem to me to have a reasonable hope of being able to achieve either justice or peace. And uh, so, and uh, I think that there are a whole host of things that should have been done and should still be done about bringing international dialogue to bear and putting other forms of heavy duty international pressure to bear not only on the Syrians and but also on Iraq, uh, Iran, uh, the Russians, a whole series of initiatives there, which we're not doing. And that's where I would say, you know, so the responsibility to protect is not an automatic answer that says intervene. As a matter of fact, it says it's the absolutely last thing to do to use military force as an intervention. And you find ways of prevention and of alternatives. On Rwanda, one of the issues that's really interesting, of course, is that there were a whole host of things going on in Rwanda for, for many years, decades, that divided Tutsi and Hutu. And the kind of action that, that came to the fore between Hutu and Tutsi in Rwanda should have been, I mean, the Catholic Relief Service was deeply involved in Rwanda for many decades before the genocide took place. And there's a very important piece written. It was a speech given at Fordham by the man who was one of the key players on the Catholic Relief Service and their role in Rwanda. And he said that the Rwanda genocide produced an enormous crisis for the Catholic Relief Service because they said, we were 25 years in Rwanda and we didn't see this coming. 
Why, why didn't we? We were doing something wrong on the ground in Rwanda that wasn't paying attention to the way the Tutsis and the Hutus were exploiting each other. And they should have been doing something to prevent that. And I think that was a big, uh, the man who wrote this, his name slips my mind now, but he was dean, he was dean of the Fletcher School at uh, Tufts for a number of years. Uh, his name will come to me in a few minutes. But that's the sort of thing that in Rwanda I would have seen. But once it got to the point where they were out there using machetes to chop people to bits, that's where I think that there should have been something that should have been done to stop it. But it shouldn't have been the f first thing. It should have been the last thing. And there were a whole host of other things that should have happened previously. Just like Syria, there's a whole host of things other than a military intervention that should be happening in Syria. Uh, you asked, I mean, we're still responding to the practical qu question. And I would say one more thing uh, back at the parish level. And that is preaching matters. In the Rwanda case, I, I'm not an expert in it, but from everything I've read, you know, Rwanda was the most Christian country in Africa by some accounts. And they had more baptized Christians. Least, yeah. They were yeah, well, of course. <laughs> um, but. Um, well, what about how many countries? Yeah, well, I'm I'm going to get there too, you know. But the you know the great scandal is that of course, tribal for most people, tribal identity uh, trumped Christian identity. What had what had not been done in the basic proclamation of the gospel, and then I think we have the same problem in the U.S. Being American trumps being Christian when it really gets down to the way most people make decision, may evaluate whether they're going to support or participate in, in war. Um, so say you basic to... preaching matters. Jose, you want to have the last word? Well, not the last word, but just basically reiterate what Sister said. I mean, the credibility of our clerical elites are relatively problematic today. So unless, as you point out, the church is able to show that it can transform its own unjust structures within the church and address seriously the institutionalized clerical sexual violence in all forms of clerical violence that are institutionalized within the church. Unless this doesn't happen, nothing can be done. But the problem is that it loses the credibility of those who are not fully within the church, but then those who are fully within the church, the faithful, of course they also don't believe that capital punishment may be evil or maybe a sin, right? So, and, and they believe that the Pope is wrong on these issues and that you guys are wrong. You are naive. This is what our Catholic faithful in Europe today support against the Pope and supporting nationalism and our Catholic faithful supporting Trump today. So it's simply a very serious question. And unless the Catholic Church is transformed, then we have one question there in the back. Uh, one question, Barry. Uh, you know, coming from Argentina and my experience of the military in Argentina. So um, have you had any intervention or have you talked to military chaplains? Or are they part of the conversation? Because there we have this kind of tiny part in the Catholic Church, but they are very vocal, they are still there. They are not international, they are very national, and we have nationalism, and they are a kind of interesting crowd there. That's a great question. I, um, the one, individually we have a little bit, but uh, San Diego University did uh, host, thank you. San Diego University did host uh, a conversation between the uh, Catholic Nonviolence Initiative, a small conversation, and the um, ethicists from the military academies uh, across the US, and a few other military officers, which was very interesting. And I, that is absolutely a direction in which this conversation has to go. You're, you're totally right. I want to thank you all very much for your attention. And uh, uh, please uh, thank the, our speakers with me.